to the Divorce Support Club podcast. Hello to you all and thank you for joining us. And um, as you all probably know, I'm Lauren Preedy from Ian Walker Family Law. I'm the head of the divorce team, um, mainly dealing with financial matters and um, separation matters. But I also deal with a bit of um, private children work as well. And the firm deals with a whole remit of anything to do with family law. So um, if you do know anybody that, that needs our help, then please don't hesitate to, to suggest they get in touch with us. Um, but the purpose of, of these sessions is for us to um, be able to deal with slightly different um, types of matters um, to do with relationships with the support of Claire. So I will hand over now for Claire to introduce herself to us as well. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much, Lauren. That's fantastic. It's going to shift my view. There we go. So. Um, first of all, just a very brief introduction to who I am. Um, everybody who's on live at the moment, I think, has been before. Um, but for the purposes of those who might watch um, later on replay, I'm Claire Black. I'm a breakup and divorce coach. Um, I'm a master NLP practitioner and a former lawyer myself. Um, I'm also the divorced mum of two boys who are now in, in their teens. I'm a second wife and a stepmom, and I'm the author of a book, uh, Break Up from Crisis to Confidence, which was published last year. Um, so if you'd like a copy of that, please do just let me know. Thank you. So today, um, the, the, uh, the focus of the Divorce Support Club that we run is really to help you concentrate on you, to become calm, to get clarity, to focus on what you can control, to see options and choices, to be able to communicate more effectively and ultimately to move through your separation or divorce or breakup and create your own vibrant future. We're going to talk about future relationships, which is exciting. So <clears throat> I love this quote and I thought I'd just start off with this. So know who you are, know what you want, know what you deserve and never settle for less. Over the last few months, we have looked at how you can rediscover more about you, create the life that you want to live. And for some people, um, a new relationship um, is part of that vision that they have for their future. And what's exciting about this is that you have a fresh page now on which you can write your future story. You've got an opportunity to focus on exactly what you like from any new relationship, whether that's a romantic relationship or a new friendship or in fact, whether you'd like to reassess some of the friendships and relationships with family that you already have, because you'll be entering any new relationship now as a different you. So it's a great time to reassess what you want in all those relationships around you. So I'm going to talk about three things um, primarily today. The first is about knowing your boundaries. The second is knowing your love language and how you um, understand love. And thirdly, knowing what you want. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about dating and some um, guidelines around that. So, boundaries. Um, Deepak Chopra described boundaries as established parameters of emotional, physical and mental space that we expect others to respect in the relationships that we have with them. He also describes boundaries as being like a screen door. Um, it allows a cool breeze to come in while it keeps insects and leaves out. And the screen door is yours to control. So you can choose whether to open it, how far to open it, and also who to open it for. Notice that if you open it too far, the leaves and insects can get in and you might struggle to push them back out again. So boundaries define what you will and won't tolerate um, in a relationship. And they're individual to you and it's really worthwhile spending some time thinking about them. And it's important to know where they lie and what you're prepared to do should somebody overstep them. When they're really clear and they're communicated to other people, you can protect your values, you can stand up for yourself. Um, although, of course, it may take a bit of practice. And I know from my own experience and also from the experience of lots of my clients, lots of us find it quite challenging to know where our boundaries lie. And we find it perhaps challenging to, um, to stand with them and to stick to them. Perhaps because we might feel guilty if we say no, or we're afraid of the consequences of disagreeing with somebody, or perhaps you've learned over a lifetime that other people's needs are perhaps more important than your own. Or maybe it's just easier sometimes to give in. But now's your time to change all of that. So the first thing that you need to do, where your boundaries lie. So <clears throat> how do you know where they lie? Well, there's a few ways. And this slide has some questions on it that will really help. 
this slide really concentrates on looking back towards your past relationships and learning from them. So it's worth asking yourself these questions and perhaps journaling about them, taking some time to consider them. So when you think back about past relationships, did your gut sometimes tell you that something was amiss, but you ignored it? Usually when our gut is telling us that there's something wrong, then there really is something wrong. And sometimes it's just a feeling. Perhaps um, you felt tight across your shoulders or you felt closed in or your stomach contracted or you just knew that something wasn't quite right and you couldn't put your finger on it. But you told yourself it didn't matter and you pushed those feelings away. When you think back, those feelings were probably sending you a message and they're feelings to watch out for in the future. Secondly, were there times when your partner treated you perhaps in a way that you didn't like? It's really worth making a list of those times and what it was that your partner did that made you feel uncomfortable or your friend if you're thinking about friendships. And use those as a starting point to remind yourself what's okay with you and what isn't okay. And that list can also really help if you ever have thoughts um, about missing your ex or wondering whether you've done the right thing. And I know that lots of you may have those thoughts too. And this list can help remind yourself of what you don't miss and what it was that you don't want to put up with again in any future relationship. And the third one, did they say or do things um, <clears throat> that made you feel uncomfortable? Perhaps they were rude to your family, perhaps they weren't very pleasant to your friends, and perhaps they made jokes that you found unacceptable. Whatever it was, have a think about what those things were and have a think about why they made, may have made you feel uncomfortable and take notice of those because you may want to put those in as boundaries um, in any future relationship. Some other questions as well. Did you feel responsible for their feelings if you said no? So remember, you are not responsible for anybody's feelings but your own. So perhaps your ex-partner made you feel guilty um, if you said no to something. Um, that isn't to say that in any relationship there isn't give and take, and that your partner's never going to be able or allowed to express that they're disappointed in something. The difference is if you felt that you were being punished for saying no. So perhaps um, if you said no, you were given the silent treatment um, or you were mocked or, or perhaps worse in your relationship. So have a think about that. Um, also, did you rush around meeting everyone else's needs but felt exhausted yourself? This is really common. We use so much energy looking after everybody else without taking time for ourselves. I mean, in future relationships, maybe think about how much you're going to be prepared to do. How much will you um, do for your partner? What kind of time will you give them? Um, would you draw the line sooner? Um, I remember very early when I met my current husband, current husband, that sounds awful, my husband, my second husband, um, he said to me, you know, don't, um, don't, don't please make dinner every time I come around to your house because otherwise I might come to expect that and then I'll be disappointed if you don't do it. So I took that on board and I definitely didn't make dinner for him every time he came over. Um, Lastly, over time, did your compromises become sacrifices? So in every relationship, there'll be compromises as two people learn to relate to each other. But what's the difference between a compromise and a sacrifice? So a compromise involves both people um, working on an issue or being involved in a discussion, while sacrifice involves disproportionate giving by one of the partners. So compromise shows a willingness to reach mutual agreement and sacrifice happens at the expense of one person. So if one partner is always abandoning their dreams to satisfy the needs of the other, that becomes a sacrifice and not a compromise. And too much sacrifice can lead to frustration and disappointment and the breakdown um, of relationships. So it's worth having a look back um, at your previous relationships and thinking about where you may have perhaps sacrificed too much and a compromise might have worked better. So once you've done that, just imagine living by the boundaries that you've set out. What would you be able to do? What would be different? How would you feel about your relationships? And ultimately, how would you feel about yourself? And just imagine how much more confident and sure of yourself you could feel, how much more nurtured and loved you could feel and how certain you could feel in your own identity if you knew what your boundaries were and you were able to live by them. So you're responsible, of course, for setting out and communicating your own boundaries. So they need to be clear and calm and concise. They need to set out a consequence. Never apologise or justify 
um, your boundary. So don't start with, I'm sorry, but. And remember, you're not responsible for their feelings. And um, once you've done that, then you can notice when someone oversteps one of your boundaries and you can choose what to do. And the reason I've picked um, a wall behind here is because boundaries are a bit like a brick wall. Um, those bricks make up the wall and you can choose, if you wish to, to take a brick out of that wall. But it's very hard to put them back in once you've taken it out. Um, so really think about um, the boundaries that you're setting and how you want to communicate them. Um, and I just thought I'd give you some examples. And some of these are really simple and some of them are really um, are much wider reaching. So um, thinking about clients. So I had a client who um, she had a new partner and he when she didn't answer her phone, it kind of he called her at 11 o'clock in the morning or 12 o'clock in the morning and she was at work and he did, she didn't answer. He would phone her then every half an hour until she did answer. So she set a boundary in place and she said, when you call me during the hours of nine to five, I'm at work and I can't answer. So please call me after six. So she set out what happened. She set out how she felt and she said, please do something different. Now he has a choice. He can choose to follow that or he can choose to do something different. And depending on what he does, she can then choose to make a different decision herself. Um, in other cases, I've had clients whose new partners have perhaps pushed them to introduce um, him or her to the children. So I remember one client who um, established a boundary of it. It was important to her that she, keep, she kept her new relationship apart from her children for the time being. And so her boundary was to say that and then to say, I'll let you know when I'm ready to introduce you. So please stop pushing me on this. Um, another one might be um, when you want to see me every day, I feel under pressure and that I'm being rushed into this faster than I want to go. So I'd like to keep our relationship to a couple of evenings a week. It's not to say that that won't change, but if you're setting out the boundary now, um, then everybody knows kind of where they stand. It's really helpful. Um, I remember one client, Alison, who um, one of her boundaries was that any future partner she had, um, she decided that it was really important to her that they were reliable and that they prioritised um, their relationship. And she met somebody at a speed dating evening and they swapped numbers and they set up this date. And it would have been her first date for 30 years. And on the afternoon of the date, he messaged her to say that he was no longer available and could they please postpone. So she spoke to a couple of friends who all started to find excuses for him. Perhaps he had a meeting, perhaps somebody was sick, um, whatever, whatever, whatever. But Alison went back to her boundaries and she sent him a message which simply said, um, I'm disappointed not to meet up as I, I thought you were lovely. But somebody else will be getting my first date now. So he'd let her down right at the beginning of this relationship. He proved he wasn't reliable and he couldn't even prioritise their first date. And that was just too much and she didn't want them to continue. So there's some examples of how you can um, communicate those boundaries and set them out. So the second thing I said I'd talk about today was um, knowing your love languages, then it's depleted. So what are these love languages? The first one, um, he says, is quality time. So if your primary love language is quality time, then you really appreciate it when the people you love spend time with you, giving you their full attention. Perhaps it means doing a joint hobby together. Perhaps it's um, setting some time aside every day to just engage in conversation for 15, 20 minutes. Um, if that's your primary language, then you will find it frustrating to be told, you know, you go ahead and do that by yourself, or um, if you feel that you're being ignored to or not listened to. The second one, um, acts of service. So if your primary love language is acts of service, then you're going to feel loved when your partner does things for you. Perhaps they make you a cup of tea every morning before they go to work, or they empty the dishwasher when you're really tired after a challenging day, or maybe they rub your shoulders when they ache whatever it might be, or they always have dinner ready um, on a Thursday because you've got something else to do. Um, if your primary language is, is acts of service, then your love tank will probably be depleted when you feel that everything's falling to you to do, when your partner isn't filling their weight um, or doesn't see when you feel tired and could do with a break. Um, then words of affirmation. So if words of affirmation are the thing that you really like, then you will feel loved when your partner tells you how much they love you, how much they value you or perhaps writes you a card telling you how they feel or gives you positive feedback about something that you've done. And on the other hand, if your partner doesn't often say that they love you or tell you that they care and appreciate you, that will hurt and your love tank will be depleted. Physical touch, that's the fourth. So if your primary love language is physical touch, then 
Um, this is the person who loves to have a hug or who likes to hold hands, who likes to sit close with you um, on the sofa. It's not all about sex, it's about just connecting through touch. So you won't like it perhaps when they forget to kiss you goodbye in the morning or they turn over in bed and, and forget to give you a hug before they go to sleep. And lastly, gifts. So some of you will probably feel loved when your partner buys you things um, and thinks of you when they see something that they know you like. So these gifts don't have to be big or expensive, but it shows that they're being thoughtful and that you're being thought about and that you're cared for. So if your primary love language is gifts, then it will really hurt if your partner, for example, forgets your birthday or neglects to buy you um, a Valentine's Day gift or whatever it might be. So it's worth thinking about which of those speaks to you? Which of these do you speak most fluently? And most of us will identify with perhaps two or three of them more than the others. So, for example, if I, if I take my case, I would much prefer to be brought a cup of tea in bed every morning than, have, um, than be bought an expensive piece of jewellery. It would mean so much more to me to have that cup of tea than the expensive gift. So whenever you enter into a new relationship, make a point of perhaps noticing clues as to your partner's preferred language, because most of us communicate in the languages that we prefer ourselves. So notice how they behave, notice how they show you that they care, and log that, that's what they would like. But also notice your own, notice your own tank, how full is it? Is your partner doing things that, that help your love tank um, to feel full? Um, I did have um, a client once who, um, when she met um, a new guy that she really liked, she used to come home from each date and put a, a pebble into um, a jar for the things that had kind of um, increased her, her tank, I suppose. And then she'd take one out if, if he did something that depleted. And she just made sure that the tank stayed at a particular level um, over time. But it's really important to communicate these to any future partner that you have. So communicate what love language um, works for you and ask them questions about theirs as well. So that's love languages. And then know exactly what you want. So I do this exercise with clients a lot, um, designing your ideal partner. So <clears throat> um, this can be um, as deep or as kind of on the surface as you like, but it should include things like, what do they look like? How old are they? Do they have children? How old are those children? I remember writing a list for myself um, and thinking I didn't really want to be with somebody who had very young children because mine were kind of um, were getting older at the time. Um, and that's fine. So what qualities do you want your new partner to have? What kind of values do you want them to hold? What kind of person do you want them to be? What hobbies would you like them to have? What kind of job would you like them to have? All of these things, write them all down, create yourself a vision. One thing to be um, perhaps careful of um, is not picking perhaps the opposite of your ex too quickly after you come out um, of a relationship. I did this. Um, so about eight months after my husband left, I started seeing somebody new who was almost the opposite of my husband in all ways. So where my husband, ex-husband, it was tall. He was quite short. He, where my ex-husband was very sociable, he was very quiet. Um, he was teetotal rather than the last person standing at the bar um, at a party. And I thought that by choosing the opposite to my ex-husband, I'd be going for what I wanted and I was wrong. In fact, there might be aspects of your ex that you appreciated and it's worth um, thinking back and perhaps noticing what they were too, um, so that you can include those in your, in your design. So when you know what you want, you're much more likely to recognize it when it is in front of you. When you know what you're looking for, you can focus on that and you'll be putting positive vibes out and attracting that from the universe. So it's really important that you keep this positive, make it clear, make it positive, make it specific. Um, even when your friends tell you that finding someone with all those qualities is impossible, don't believe them. It is absolutely possible. The only negative things on this list, I would say, are maybe your two or three deal breakers. So are there any things that you just could not accept? For me, um, going out with a smoker was I just didn't want to do that. So is there anything that you want to add on that list that you absolutely don't want? Um, and then keep those because then you can notice if you, you know if you meet somebody who ticks every other box, but not those, you can then go to them and say, okay, is that deal breaker still really important to me or not? And do I want to let it go or not? So those are the three kind of tips for working out, um, knowing your boundaries, also knowing how you want to be loved and knowing what you want. 
So let's have a quick look at dating. And I know that this can be um, a really scary world to go into. So the first question, I suppose, is how do I know that I'm ready? So this is a really personal thing. And the way that I look at it is that dating is an opportunity to find out what you do and don't like. It's trial and error. You can dip your toes in the water. You can meet somebody for, um, for a drink or you can meet somebody for a coffee. You can now meet somebody over video on most of the dating apps. You can find out about them. You can see how you feel. It's meant to be fun. So if the whole idea fills you with absolute horror, then that's probably a sign that you're not quite ready to dip your toe um, in the water just yet. When you're feeling more confident about yourself, you know who you are, you've done all the work that we've talked around about um, around values and boundaries, and you know what you do and don't want and what you will and won't accept, then you're probably in a much better position to go back out on that dating market. Um, and I'd also say, remember, you don't have to be meeting your future wife or husband right now you could actually be meeting Mr Fun on a Friday night right now um, instead so you know take it easy and, and don't get don't take it too seriously I suppose is the message so some quick tips for dating again um, first of all take your time so take your time to find out about people um, in some ways, it's easier now that um, a lot of it is done online due to the pandemic because you can meet somebody over video. Um, you can be absolutely in a safe space. Um, apparently, this is called Darcying. I didn't know this, but finding out about somebody slowly without the chemistry of actually being in the room with them um, is called Darcying. So you can use video meets to filter who you want to actually meet in real life. Um, be honest on your profile. So use up to date pictures, show pictures of you doing your hobbies, doing things that you enjoy. Um, have fun with it. You don't need to miss, meet Mr or Miss forever. As I said, you could just meet Mr um, or Miss, have some fun with. Um, know what you're looking for. As I've just said, create your ideal partner, know what it is that you want. And then see each date as an opportunity. So it might not be an opportunity to meet your future spouse, but it could be an opportunity to meet some really interesting people who perhaps share the same hobbies of you, and then it's also an opportunity to find out more about the sort of people that you do and don't want to spend your time with. Um, beware of the rebound. Um, divorce is challenging and you can be emotionally fairly vulnerable um, after it. So just be aware of those kind of rebound relationships. And again, going back to number one, take your time so that you make sure that you this is the right thing for you. And then lastly, um, recognise the types that you want to avoid. So I'm just going to run through some types to avoid here. So um, first of all, the love bomber. So these are the people who want to sweep you off your feet. They send you excessive numbers of messages. They might tell you that they love you very, very quickly. They might tell you that they fell for you just from looking at your photograph. Um, they might encourage you to ditch um, an arrangement that you've already got with a friend to see them instead. And it just feels all too quick, too much too soon. And actually, that can be a sign that you found somebody who actually wants to control you. Um, so just watch out for that love bombing. Um, then there's Mr. or Mrs. Angry. So this is the person who gets irritated or very annoyed quickly. If you don't reply soon enough, they might complain, they might sulk. Or perhaps there are lots of details on their profile about what they don't want. So don't contact me if you're too thin. Don't contact, contact me if you wear glasses or whatever it might be. These people are likely to be really hard work. So avoid those. Then there's the ones that you can't pin down. So you might have lots of messages. This person might be really funny, might be really witty, but the minute you ask to talk on the phone or perhaps meet over Zoom or even meet for a walk, they disappear and they can't be pinned down to actually meet. That would be a red flag of uh, somebody who really doesn't want to commit. Then there's the scammer. So these can be quite dangerous. So they, they always have a sob story. They just lost their job. They just need some cash to tide them over. Um, I spoke to a lady recently who had been taken in by somebody who um, had told her that he just needed enough money to have a ticket to come to the UK and he'd sent her his LinkedIn profile and all sorts of things and um, seem to be very real, but they aren't. So just watch out for those. If things don't stack up, they probably don't stack up. Then there's the people who are not looking for anything serious um, and they say so in their profile. So when someone tells you what they're looking for, believe them. So perhaps, um, you know, Mr. Not Looking for Anything Serious wants a, a casual relationship, some fun, not a long term relationship. And that's fine if that's what you want as well. But just be aware of what they're saying um, 
in their profile and, and take it on board. When someone tells you who they are, listen. Then there's the player who has lots of pictures of him or herself, often with um, lots and lots of people of the opposite sex who aren't their brother or sister. They get around, they play the field, and you probably won't be the only person that they're talking to or seeing either. And then there are the sexters. So these are the ones who can't wait to send you pictures of certain parts of their anatomy. Um, I'm not quite sure why anybody would want to do that, um, but the most likely answer would probably be because they're looking for a casual hookup um, for sex, I think. And they'll ask for similar pictures in return. So don't waste those time on those unless that's what you want to do as well. And there's also the dangers around um, photographs on the internet, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I steer clear of those. Then there are the people who are the hiders. So they don't have any photos there. They don't have any um, photos um, without sunglasses on or that aren't blurred or where they're not wearing a hat. What are they hiding? There's a reason that they're not showing you. Um, maybe it's because they don't want their spouse to see their entry on the dating app. And I know that's fairly common. And then there's the eternal, um, the eternal single. So this person's always out, they've always got a glass in hand, they're with a big group of friends, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but if all their pictures are like that, then they're probably eternally single, they enjoy life like it is, and they don't want to be tied down. Again, if that's how you, um, how you feel in the relationship you want to pursue, then that's brilliant. But just be aware of that if you're looking for more that you could get hurt in that scenario. So. I'm going to stop the sharing because I've got some questions as well that have um, come up um, before the session, which I'd like to answer around dating and things as well. So one question that came up that, um, that was really interesting, I thought, was um, around sex. So is it appropriate to ask if um, a new partner has been screened for STDs? I would say yes, absolutely appropriate to ask that question. Um, and also, if they haven't been tested, to ask that they go and and get tested and you could do the same. So I think that's a really wise thing to do. Following on from that, um, the question was, what's the protocol with condoms? So my response to this is that this is absolutely an issue of what you're comfortable with and how much you trust um, any new partner. So a request for a new partner to wear a condom should never be a problem. And it should be able to be had as an open conversation. And if you feel that they might get angry or refuse for some reason, then it's worth weighing up the risks. Is it worth sleeping with somebody who doesn't respect your wish for safety? At the bottom line, this is your body. Um, and if you don't feel safe about a new partner's um, STD status, then there's no reason why you should have unprotected sex with them. And that probably would form a boundary um, for you. Please wear a condom or I'm not going to sleep with you. Um, and you could also carry your own to make sure that there's no kind of, well, we haven't got one, so we can't. Um, don't put your sexual safety in someone else's hands. Um, and I think if you're a man listening to this, then be sensitive perhaps to this issue, because I get asked this a lot um, by women. Um, and I think this is a really important thing to discuss very early on, um, preferably not in the heat of the moment. Um, I did have another couple of questions as well. So um, everyone has baggage from previous relationships. How can I tell if someone I meet has dealt with their past in a positive way? So I would say that there are certain things probably to look out for. So do um, does this new person talk about their ex a lot? And particularly, do they have nothing positive to say about their ex? For me, that's always a red flag. Do they take responsibility for their part in the ending of any previous relationship? And I'd be watching out for inconsistencies, perhaps, in what they say. And then also listen to your gut. You know, what's your gut feel? What's your intuition telling you? Um, as well as perhaps watching out for red flags in their treatment of you. So for example, some of those things that I highlighted earlier, you know, love bombing. Is this person just a bit too intense? Um, also, how do they communicate if there's ever an issue between you? Do they discuss it through? Um, are they able to compromise? Or do they perhaps um, go silent or stonewall you or argue in, a, in an aggressive way? So are you able to talk things through to find a solution that you're both happy with? And also, do they do things that um, overstep your boundaries? So do they respect your boundaries when you ask them? So how do they react when you let them know where your boundary lies? Do they listen? Do they take note? Or do they continue to trample on them? And if they continue to trample on them, that's their choice. 
and then you have a choice as to whether you um, enforce that boundary and perhaps um, leave that relationship. So I would say um, three things really, looking out for what they talk about and whether they take responsibility, how you, you feel about it in your gut and whether there's any red flags um, that arise. So those were um, my top tips in terms of new relationships and um, answering a couple of the questions that I've had already. Um, so Lauren, what is there anything you'd like to add to any of that? Just a few thoughts and kind of notes that I made of things that kind of resonated with me and that comes up a lot in the things that, that I deal with is is the whole issue about the boundaries and compromise. Mm. And I, I would say from, from scenarios that I see a lot, sometimes you might not know what those boundaries are until somebody's crossed it. Yes, that's although, very true. So although you may have something in your mind about something, to not then feel like you can't tell that person how you feel post the event, I suppose, is how I'm <laughs> trying trying to describe it. Yes, and I suppose that's one of the things, um, how you can tell whether they've dealt with their baggage. You know, if, if they overstep a boundary that you didn't even realise was there, and then you communicate that boundary to them, how do they then react? Do they respect it or do they continue to trample on it? Yeah, and how do you, and do you feel that you're able to bring that up? Yeah, and I think that boundaries, not just in romantic relationships, can be difficult. Mm. And it, I think that as a society, maybe I'm generalising too much, that's always been something that has been difficult for people to talk about. And that's why, like, the week of the Mental Health Awareness Week also, I think all these issues are coming to the forefront and people are realising how important it is in our everyday life. Mm. And I, I suppose it's it's to not be afraid to explore these things in whatever way you feel you need to. And but but nothing static and it might change. So that's kind of my view on 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 that. And yeah, I also then you'll probably find them um, that you have some boundaries that shift over time that you can you start off with it being quite rigid and then you can relax it over time as the trust builds between you. But there are other boundaries which are absolutely fundamental and are lines that must never be crossed. Yeah. And, and the other note I'd made was about the apologising. And again, <laughs> I, I think that that's in a lot of people's nature to apologise for things all the time in all areas of your life. And I think that can be a particularly difficult habit, if I can, <laughs> if I can say that, to break if you're always used, if, if you're not confident to assert your mm. position. And that's yeah. where, of course, the work that you do, Claire, is really important because um, that's the bit that you can help people with. Yeah, and, um, you know, it's it, there's several steps to it. So there's identifying what, what the boundary was and then there's working out what you want to say and then there's practising it. You know, so actually, when you when you know that you've got something you need to say to a new partner or, or to a friend or whatever it might be that they've upset you or they've done something, um, stand in front of a mirror, practice it, say it over and over, because um, the more that you practice it, the more your brain will think you've already done it. And when you come to do it in real life, it will be a lot easier to do. Um, so, yes, yeah, so and mentally rehearsing and physically rehearsing and role playing these things is really important. And. You know, we all get stuck in habits, don't we? So, and we English in particular, we're very good at saying, oh, sorry, when, you know, I say sorry sometimes when somebody treads on my foot. And I think, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> Afterwards, I shouldn't be apologising for that. But, you know, we're very quick to apologise. Mm. Um, the other thing about apologies, I guess, is apologise when you need to. It's important to say sorry when you have done something to hurt another person, perhaps in, unintentionally, to apologise. And then, I was, as I say to my children, the best form of a proper apology is actually a change in behaviour. So apologising and meaning it and then actually doing something differently next time. Mm -hmm. And I also thought the, the bit about the ideal partner was interesting as well, mm -hmm. because well, from a personal perspective, what I thought was my ideal partner when I was younger isn't. Mm -hmm. um, hence... Um, I think that I also am divorced, as, as many of you know, um, and we remained as friends, which mm. I know can't happen in other situations. Sometimes it can, and, and I feel lucky that I can retain some of that, which links into appreciating your old partner's qualities. So I'm in a position where I, 
I, I can acknowledge that, but it takes a long time to do that, I think. And I suppose also acknowledging your taking, being accountable for your own behaviors as well. And as you said, if, if there's something about your own behavior that needs tweaking or you're not happy with, to not be afraid to address that. Mm. Yes, yes, to look at to look at self and think about, okay, well, what's my role in this? So I always think that um, whenever I see somebody saying, well, you know, every relationship you have is 50% that person, 50% this person, I always think, actually, no, I don't agree with that. Every relationship we have is 100% you and 100% me. We're both in that relationship 100%. And we're both 100% responsible for our own part in that relationship. And we're both 100% responsible for our own responses. And also our own way of communicating. You know, there are kind ways of communicating and there are unkind ways of communicating. So when I say you're not responsible for somebody else's reactions, you're not responsible for their reactions, but you are responsible for the way that you communicate whatever it is you want to to them. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So no, I think that was that was really very helpful. Claire, and as, as we've said before, it's not just applying to romantic relationships, mm. it's applying to those other difficult situations that may, might come up. And, and when you are separating, you have to have, in many cases, continuing relationships with the in-laws because yep. your grandparents, your children. And that can give a, a, a very um, difficult issue with boundaries because they may have one set of boundaries with their own child, i.e., the father or mother but you don't want to engage with them in that same way for instance like they shouldn't walk straight into your house because mm. then they you, you don't want them to do that and yeah. that, that might have been something that they've always done when you were together as a couple mm. so, yeah so don't be afraid to have those conversations I'm, I've had those conversations myself um after um, my ex-husband moved out and he still had a key um and actually I spoke to him a few weeks later and said look it's no longer appropriate for you to just come into the house. So I'd appreciate it if you would ring the doorbell like other visitors now. And he did, um, you know, because, you know, that it was a reasonable um, request to make. I know that some ex-spouses probably wouldn't respond in the same way. And then you need to think about what to do from there. But, um, you know, with with extended family and things as well, I've, I've had a few clients who, for example, their ex has been unhappy that they've continued a relationship with extended members of family um, and I, I always take the view that actually the, the, the two of you are divorced but that doesn't mean necessarily that you both have to divorce the extended family as well so it is perfectly possible to remain friends with your ex-mother-in-law for example or your ex-sister-in-law or um, you know and even if your ex is unhappy about that actually you and your ex-sister-in-law for example are the two people in that relationship um, and if you want to continue a relationship then you should be in a, you know you should be allowed to do so i'm not saying put it in front of your ex all the time and kind of you know right up front in front of their face and, and push their face in it but there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to continue relationships with those people independently mm. you know i definitely think this topic of boundaries will probably need some revisiting by us at some point mm. because I think that there's an awful lot that we can't cover in this time that I think comes up in an awful lot of different scenarios so um, any any questions anybody has please do send those in mm. um, or if it's in the context of, of that we haven't covered let us know because I, I, I do think that, uh, that it's an important thing and it comes up a lot in the in the clients that I have yeah, there's one other um, area in this where this comes up a lot, and it's in terms of the boundaries around what the new partner's role might be. Um, so, for example, um, <clears throat> you have a new partner and you have children that you share with your ex-partner. What role does that new partner have in those in those children's lives? Um, the way I always view it is that um, you need to be fairly cautious where there are children involved. Um, I'm often asked how long should I wait until I introduce a new partner to my children? Um, there's no right and wrong answer, but I would always wait until you know that this new relationship is a committed one, that it's fairly serious. Um, and I would always make sure that you make, you say to the children that um, you'll listen to their concerns um, and don't expect your new partner to take on a disciplinary role um, with your children. Don't try and make them into their new father or their new mother um, because that will always backfire. 
Um, so it's very important to kind of keep the boundaries around um, that relationship as well. And if you can have that discussion with your new partner around what their role is going to look like um, and how they're going to be with the children. Um, because they need to be friendly, but they don't need to be um, a disciplinarian necessarily. Although if they're ever left with the children on their own, they need to be able to handle them. So um, it can be a bit of a minefield, that one. And so it's really worth thinking about where your boundaries lie um, around that too, before you introduce a new partner to your children and into your home. Brilliant. No, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for joining us, um, if you've joined live. And also thank you if you're watching this um, as a recording. And, and as I said earlier, if you do have any questions, please make sure you let us know or any feedback. It's much appreciated. Yeah. And um, nice. To, yep. Yeah, nice to see you all. And, and well, depending on when you're watching this, have a good weekend. Indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, all take care of yourselves.